this is this week's back. Questions? Yeah, I'm sorry, I realized I didn't on that one. Um, okay, so this is from the ASV guidelines for standards of care when they when they're talking about population management. And they say population management describes an active process of planning, ongoing daily evaluation, and response to changing conditions as an organization cares for multiple animals. Um, and so really what we're talking about is management, right? I mean, and if you think about any other field that has things arriving and things leaving, that would be managed. That would be a managed process. So we want to make sure that that's happening. Effective population management requires a plan for intentionally managing each animal's shelter stay that takes into consideration the organization's ability to provide care that meets the recommendations outlined in the document of the guidelines for standards of care. And so what we saw in the game is really this, that efficiency has an enormous effect on capacity. So when I'm talking about capacity, I'm talking about the capacity to be able to provide the kind of care that you want and how much capacity you need as well in terms of housing capacity. And then your capacity actually also feeds back on your efficiency, right? When you, if, you're, if you're trying to care for twice as many animals than you can actually really do effectively, you become less and less efficient in sort of a vicious cycle as we've talked about through all sorts of things, behavioral problems, disease problems, um, stress problems with staff, safety issues, all of those things. So what I'm trying to get at, and I think maybe uh, it'll be easier for you guys to think about once we talk about this, is something called pathways. So the way I think about animals moving through shelters is I think about each animal kind of on a train to somewhere. That every time an animal comes to a shelter, it's like they're on a platform, and they should be getting a ticket going somewhere. Um, and so if we think about that from intake to outcome, we could say, well, one pathway is from stray holding to adoption. Another pathway would be owner surrender to adoption. So on this pathway, in most, most places, there is no holding required. So this is a place where we could say, hey, you know what? If a little Yorkie puppy comes in, Let's just put it up for adoption. If it's healthy, let's do an evaluation and put it right up for adoption. And in some cases, I've actually been in shelters where we've done things like that and sat with a watch to see how long it takes for that animal to get adopted. Um, so a trap near to return program where the animal comes in and we say, we're not putting this animal up for adoption. It's not even going into our adoption program. We're just going to do trap near to return. That's the pathway that that animal is going to go on. Um, maybe the animal comes in, and this kind of is in line with what you were talking about, that the animal has a behavioral problem that needs re rehabilitation before adoption. So we know it's going to go on that pathway. Um, when do you think we'd want to find that out? As soon as possible, right? And so even if we could find that out as the animal was coming in, that would be great, because why make them stand on the platform for three or four days um, when their behavior is actually probably likely to deteriorate without getting appropriate intervention in a shelter, right? Medical rehabilitation before adoption, so same deal. We want to know that as quickly as we possibly can. And then this one is really important, too, is a limited expectation for positive outcome. When would we want to identify this? I guess I'm really all of these, right? They're saying as soon as you can, um, which is true. That we want to, we basically want to give each animal a ticket as they come in. Can they change their ticket? For sure. So lots of nodding. <laughs> For sure, we can change the ticket. And one of the things that we recommend is to do something called daily rounds, where every day somebody's going through and sort of seeing, well, which pathway is this animal on? Is that a good choice? Did something change about this animal? You know, did the cat come in and it seemed like it was crazy or it seemed like it was feral and we thought it was going to go a certain way, but now it's not anymore. So we're going to change that pathway. We're going to change the direction. But we always want to be sure that everybody's on the track to somewhere. So here's an example. This is Biscuit, the bat cat. Um, he came into a shelter. He was underage. He was a single kitten. 
Um, so we know he was has high risk of being susceptible to disease. He needed socialization. Um, he also uh, had a high potential for adoption where he came in, which was actually in Dane County. Um, but because he was all by himself, we wonder, well, what's the likelihood of disease? Why is he by himself? Where is the rest of his litter? Where is his mother? Um, what happened? So he went, his pathway was to have stray holding in foster care. Um, and then, so he received just supportive care because he was young. Um, while he was in foster care, he was returned to the shelter for a neuter, a microchip, and exam, and adopted from foster care. And so if we want to think about what his pathway looked like, Here's what his pathway looked like in a really nice straight arrow, which is what we'd really like to have animal pathways look like. And if we think about the game, this is probably what a pathway in shelter A looks like. Here's what a pathway in shelter B might look like. And so when I was saying, well, what makes lengths of stay longer, this is often what makes lengths of stay longer. So instead of doing stray holding in shelter housing, he stayed, um, I'm sorry, so instead of going to foster care, he stayed in shelter housing after seven to 10 days, broke with upper respiratory disease. Then he needed to wait for a foster home because there's fewer foster homes that are going to be interested and willing to take a kitten who's sick and needs a lot of care and might have some kind of contagious disease. So he had to wait to get into a foster home. Finally gets placed for supportive care in a foster home. Then he gets returned for neuter and microchips, and now he's hooking up with his other pathway again. Um, now he goes, instead, he has to go for adoption uh, into the adoption area at the shelter because he didn't get adopted from his foster home. So now he's waiting for adoption. And now, hopefully, he got adopted if he made it through all of that, if his URI was curable, if the shelter had enough resources to hold him for so long. Does this make sense? So can you see really clearly, like, this is the difference between shelter A and shelter B, that we can wind up on these kind of long, winding roads that aren't going where we want them to? Yeah. Sure is. So great question. The question is, if you can't do anything about the stray holding period, what can you do to make your line straighter? Because sometimes the stray holding period almost feels like it's dooming you, right? To Because they have to stay so long that they're all going to get you or I or come across. Um, Dane County Humane Society right now is an awesome example of this. They've implemented a program that we call Open Selection. Um, which is a program that I actually have a little case study to show you about too, but let me tell you a little bit about them just because your question comes at a, at a good time. With open selection, rather than just holding animals for the stray holding period, you actually take advantage of it. So animals are available for pre-selection during their stray holding period. It's a program that works especially well when the owner return rate is not real high. So for Dane County Humane Society, they do open selection for cats because the owner return rate to cats is pretty low. The owner return rate to dogs is really high. So if they made all the, all the dogs available for selection, it would probably make enormous amounts of confusion because most dogs that come in, the majority, go back to their owners, um, whereas the cats, very, very few do. So the animals come in, they get an evaluation at the point of intake, and they go straight up to be available for selection. Many of those cats are selected within the first day or two of their stray holding period. On day seven, they're spayed and neutered. On day eight, they're gone. And so what happens is you didn't fix the stray holding period, but anything past the stray holding period gets fixed. And so you have so many fewer animals in the shelter. Um, the other thing is that owner surrendered animals also are doing fast tracking. So rather than going into okay, so this is Hillsborough County Animal Services. This is in Tampa, Florida. 
this is the first place that we ever convinced to do this open selection. They call it open access. Um, it's a big shelter, 21,000, almost 22,000 impounds in a year. Um, and they do uh, countywide responsibility really for animal control. Um, big area. They have won numerous awards for their an animal cruelty and dog fighting investigation. So they have a lot of investigation dogs that they house there as well. They included this slide. This is all their volunteers who have them work on this. They, the problems they identified, and they put this little PowerPoint together. were high intake compared to live release, low adoption numbers, limited number of animals offered to the public in the designated adoption area. So they were picking which animals to put up for adoption. Um, internal conflict about life and death decisions and a high level of stress in terms of sort of deciding which animals to put up for adoption and which ones to um, euthanize. Euthanasia of many highly adoptable animals, um, some with treatable conditions. Um, the objective of their open access plan was to offer visibility to most animals. Um, the exceptions were for investigations, dogs, and quarantines, because they decided they wanted to try letting the public decide. In select what they thought was the most adoptable. It created lower stress level among staff and volunteers. So what did we change? The first thing, they, one of the things they did was to decrease their owner surrender hours and to make owner surrender a little bit more difficult. So you had to make an appointment. You had to, there was certain things you had to do, whereas before, um, they, when we sat down to really talk about it, we almost felt like they were kind of facilitating the idea that pets were disposable, that it was so easy to give up your pet, um, that they were sort of uh, wanted to do something different with that. So open selection, what they did was, this is a layout of their kennel, so you can see They closed off um, these ones that have X's on them. Those were the animals that weren't part of open selection. But the rest of the shelter became open for people to come in. And if they saw a dog in its holding period, they could meet the dog. Um, this, they changed their impound procedures. So the people who were taking animals in from animal control officers would do a very, very brief sort of just a little assessment of the animal's behavior to decide, is this animal safe for the public or not? Um, and uh, this is, the, it says visitation. So if the animal um, was safe, then they would say, yes, the animal could have visitation. And here's a picture of somebody having visitation um, with somebody is uh, who's selecting them. So um, if somebody selected one of these dogs, they were told if the owner comes, animal will go back to its owner. If the owner doesn't come, the animal will be spayed and neutered on the day after the last day of its holding period, and you need to come and pick the animal up and take it home that evening. And people did it. And um, so that was a really important part of it. The other piece of it was what was called a transition program, um, where if a volunteer wanted to commit to an animal, they could commit to that animal and take the animal home. And then they could adopt the animal from their home, but the animal still got adopted through the, um, through the animal shelter. Uh, it shared the responsibility for placing some of the kind of higher fruits. Um, and again, it really worked very well. Um, and it helped a lot of less adoptable animals and really good candidates that just didn't get selected during the first open selection process. They set this priority, which I thought was a really interesting one. So the first person who, could, who had priority was a citizen. So if a rescue group came in and said, oh, we want this dog, they would get it unless 
a citizen came in after them and said, I want the dog. Because what they wanted was to have the animals go directly into a home if it could. Um, so citizens always got priority. The next priority went to employees. Um, but they were only allowed to put their holds on after two business days. After that, it went to proactive rescue partners. So they have rescue partners who come to the shelter every single day to select animals, and that was that's how they work. Um, and so they got the, uh, sort of rewarded for being proactive. They could pick. Um, they had a higher priority than rescue groups who were reactive to say, you know, if somebody called them to tell them there was a pinky knee you know, they would come get it. Um, and so they still had priority, but they were after the proactive. Um, and then uh, if those people didn't pick them, then they could either go into a volunteer or into that transition program. They um, created a, uh, what they call the heart team, which was, uh, it was composed of two employees from the shelter, from the field, which is the animal control services, veterinary services, and the volunteer section, the manager of each section designated which employee would serve in heart, and then they would walk all together, walk through the shelter, as I said, doing that daily round and sort of seeing which pathway each animal was on and making a decision about whether they wanted to change that pathway or not. Um, so that kind of introduces that, that concept. it working. Um, this graph has an enormous scale, so I hope you can appreciate that what looks like this tiny little bump um, is actually going from 4,000 to almost six or 7,000 um, in terms of their adoptions and transfers. So they went really way up. Um, and their intake and euthanasia was going way down. Um, their live release um, went way up. Uh, this was the start year, this lower green bar, and then it went up. Um, this is a little drop I'll come back to. And then this was really interesting to see. Um, this is their average length of stay during this time period. So you can see it was much longer, and then it dropped really significantly. So even though that's only about five days, if you multiply five days by 20,000 animals a year, um, that's a pretty enormous change in the number days, and then um, that drop continued down to just a little bit over 10 days. Um, and so this was a really dramatic change for them. What's interesting, if you look at this graph, is, is that um, the average length of stay for adoption and transfer was a little bit different. And here you can see it continued to fall for adoption. One of the reasons that it didn't, um, it continued, sorry, to fall for transfer but then went up a little bit for adoption. At least one of the things that we think is associated with that is that there were huge budget cuts all over the state of Florida. And one of the things they had to do was close a day for adoption. So people couldn't pick up their animals like on a Wednesday when the shelter was closed. But the rescue groups still could. It was closed to the public. But since the rescue groups were sort of trained to be in the shelter, they could still come in and take the animals. And so it's really interesting if you look at this that you can actually see that really made a difference in terms of length of stay and the trending for the adoptions versus the transfers. Mm -hmm. So different shelters work in different ways, but I haven't had that's always been a concern when the shelter has started a program like this, but it, it has never panned out to actually be true. Um, not to an extent that it actually really affected the program in an adverse way. So some shelters will actually do all the paperwork, and then you sign over the paperwork when you come to get the animal. Most shelters don't have people pay in advance, partly because if the owner comes, then the owner gets the dog. Some shelters will have um, people leave a deposit that's refundable if the owner comes to get the dog. But in most cases, it really does seem like if somebody goes through the effort of meeting and selecting and 
doing all that stuff that they really want the animal, and they come. Um, and usually there's even competition, so if they don't come, there's usually somebody right behind them who wants the animal too. One thing that I think is really interesting about this program that I've seen, and I am not an expert on marketing, um, and there are some in sheltering, which is great, and I wish there were even more, because um, so much of life saving depends on marketing <laughs> these animals, um, is that something about the idea of something that's only sort of available is really appealing <laughs> to people. Um, something that, you know, well, you might be able to have it if somebody else doesn't come get it, um, I think makes animals even more appealing and makes people want to, you know, put their name down so that they're all signed up for it so it doesn't, that deal doesn't get away. Um, and so that's been something really interesting to watch in this. And uh, I'm sure somebody's done research on sort of marketing and understanding people's psychology around something that you can only sort of have and how much that makes you want it. Um, but I don't, I don't have that. Um, so they report that the staff are significantly happier. One of the funniest things that happened in this particular shelter is they had built a brand new adoption center. Um, and it had single-sided runs, so we weren't really thrilled about them using it as an adoption center and housing animals there during the whole period of getting adopted. But what ended up happening is that so many animals were getting selected during this pre-selection process that there really weren't animals to move into the adoption center because they were all kind of flying out of the shelter either to rescue or transfer. So they ended up using their adoption center as their surgical recovery area. So the animals would go get spayed and neutered and then go recover there and then go home from that adoption center. Um, and so that was, uh, that was kind of a just a neat way of sort of articulating how well this worked. This again is a, a PowerPoint they put together and this is their picture of some of the things that are making them really happy. This is uh, one of these pictures is a dog who came in who had mammary tumors, six mammary tumors, and um, you know they were able to because they had more time and they had more space and more resources, they were able to actually do surgery and remove those and, and find her a home. Um, they were able to do an amputation on this dog who had been part of an animal cruelty case. They were able to treat this dog who had ichthyosis and um, also working with rescues um, at, for dogs who had demodex. And so that was something that really hadn't been kind of part of their set of things that they would be able to achieve um, because they were so, um, so busy just kind of maintaining everything. So any questions about those? I have another really fun one. And then we'll go back to the sort of standard part of the, the conversation. Yeah. So the, yeah, so the question is about behavior evaluation and if the animal comes in and is kind of having a tricky evaluation, do shelters make a snap decision at that point? And that's not what we recommend. So, and what this shelter did is just to say, that animal isn't an animal we would put into visitation. But then the rounds process should protect against that. So people should be looking at those animals every day and Again, what I think that should do is send up a giant red flag to say, this animal has needs. Let's figure out what we can do for those needs. Emily Weiss did a great little study, and she hasn't published the data. I'm not sure if she's going to or not, but I, she gave me the data, um, at Wisconsin Humane. And what they did is they did some evaluations at intake. So as the animals were coming in, they did evaluations on them. If the evaluation was good, they would redo the evaluation in three days. They would just let the animal go through, and they would redo the evaluation. And in most cases, it was the same. So the animal came in, no problems. Three days later, usually, no problems. If problems were identified, they would intervene for a three-day period, offering behavioral support and enrichment. And in almost every case, the evaluations were better after three days than they were at the point of intake. 
Um, not in every case. Um, the idea, I think, behind it is if it's good, like if it comes in and, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but you know, it comes in, it takes treats gently, it's got great manners, it's really friendly, you know, why wait three days to see if three days from now it's still really friendly and takes treats gently and, and does all those things? Why not, you know, just let that animal go? It's kind of that same principle of, you know, if it's really cute and healthy, why hold on to it? Why not let it go? Because if you let those ones go, then you can spend time on the ones who came in who had a problem and they really need you for something. It's all a question of, in, in some ways, what they need you for. So the thing the orange kitten needs you for is to set him up to get out of there as fast as possible. But the thing that the dog that's really scared and, and shy needs from you is behavioral support, and that may take a little longer. Yeah. Different protocol for pit bulls. Why would there be a different protocol for pit bulls? Hmm. I haven't ever heard of that. Um, I got the greatest email. Yeah, so the question, she said that sometimes um, in some shelters she's heard or experienced that people would wait three days to see if the pit bull would become kennel aggressive. Um, what I will say is that I think pit bulls, um, I, when I uh, think of pit bulls going into animal shelters, I think of it as kind of like taking a triathlete and locking them in a closet. <laughs> so they don't, you know, they definitely do as a breed have a harder time with confinement, I think. They really need to get out. So to me, I would want to do exactly the opposite. That if a, if a dog was doing really well, then I'd, again, want to get it out quickly while it was doing really well. Um, I had a great email from somebody today who was talking about pit bulls. I have an incredibly cute pit bull puppy, Foster, right now. He's going home on Monday. Um, lucky for me, because otherwise I would be crying. <laughs> but um, somebody sent me this email talking about pit bulls, and in there they said um, that they wanted to be clear that, um, that they understood that pit bulls are just dogs, um, which is the way I think in general the, is true. And I think what's too bad is that they've gotten so much publicity about not being just dogs that the real hang-up for pit bulls in shelters is that they have a lower potential for adoption because there's so many barriers in the way. The insurance company won't let you have a pit bull even if you own your home. The landlord won't let you have a pit bull. Um, you know, all of those things. Plus, they're coming in in disproportionate proportion to the other breeds. So I don't think there's anything inherent that would make me want to do that. And I've not heard of a shelter that does that. But that doesn't mean that there aren't any. Is that? Yeah. It's brief. Yeah. They weren't doing those kinds of things in Tampa. But remember, also, they went from not doing any behavior evaluation to doing something. Um, Cindy's going to talk about this, I think, when she comes. I'm not totally sure if she will, so I'll, I'll remind you that one of the real issues with behavior evaluations in shelters right now is that we don't have a behavioral evaluation that's actually got research to show that it's got a predictive value for how the animal will behave in a home. And so I think you always have to you know, think about the behavior. When I say a behavior evaluation, usually what I mean is from the moment the animal comes within your purview to the moment the, the animal leaves, its behavior should be observed and understood and monitored and responded to. What a lot of people mean is just this little either 15 minute or hour long window where they're doing a behavior e evaluation, a behavior assessment. And those certainly have some value, but we need to be sure that we're always putting those in the context of what we understand about the animal, including its behavioral history, if we have any, and what we see the animal doing in the shelter on a daily basis. And it's really hard to do. Um, you know, it's, it's a harder kind of assessment to make. So um, I don't know. You know, is 
a 15 minute or an hour long evaluation on a dog that's a giant, you know, friendly doofus when it comes into the shelter, like, I don't know, is that better than the, you know, five or 10 minute evaluation or the experience of the field officer who picked that dog up when it was out running around? you know, and the interactions that they had with it. So um, food guarding in particular you should look, because um, there's some really amazing recent research that they did at Center for Shelter Dogs showing that the, the food aggression is not a predictive factor, particularly in those evaluations. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, how do you predict? I mean, how do you define an eight-year-old? Sorry, so the question was about, you know, what kinds of restrictions should shelters put on animals in terms of other animals in the home or other humans in the home? And I can't answer that question. Um, you know, I can certainly share you know, my views on it, but I think it's really hard. What criteria do you use to say a 10-year-old? You know, I could bring you in, <laughs> I should do this one day, I could bring you in a set of 10-year-olds and, and watch the way they interact with animals, and I guarantee there's going to be, you know, an enormous range. Um, so it might be better to say something like, you know, um, is sensitive to handling and have a conversation with the parents to say, do you think that's a dog that would do well with your child? Um, but again, you know, these are tricky decision. Um, yeah, we can go way off course with that too. <laughs> So are there lots of, the question is, are there lots of situations where somebody's pre-selected an animal and then the owner shows up? Not that I've heard of. Um, and again, the big thing is that this is a program that we tend to steer shelters towards where um, the return to owner rate is, is fairly low in the first place. It does happen sometimes. And what's been really neat, especially like I, a lot of my experience just most recently, because I just, the Dane County just finished implementing this program last year. Um, a lot of the time, the person who selected the animal is just thrilled. They're like, oh, great, you know, let them go back to their home and they just pick someone else. Um, so that's been primarily the experience that I have heard about, not that people get mad. Um, and I think a lot of that is about communication, to make sure that you've communicated clearly. Our goal is to get this animal back to its owner. You know, if its owner comes, then we'll give it back to the owner. Yeah. I think, I think each shelter approaches that differently. Again, in general, so the question, sorry is about if there's different protocols for bully breeds. And again, I think each shelter approaches that in their own way. But I think the sort of general, I hope anyway, that the general gist is to not sort of specify by breed, not um, discriminate really um, by breed, and to let animals go through based on that animal's behavior and that animal's, per, you know, the personality that it's showing you at that point. It's, you know, when I talk about behavior evaluation, I'm saying behavior evaluation on purpose and not temperament evaluation because I don't know that, you know, I don't think you could evaluate my temperament in an hour, um, especially, you know, if I was really stressed. I hope you wouldn't evaluate my temper in an hour during a period that I was really stressed. Um, and I don't know that, you know, that we can really say that we're reading an animal's temperament. We can certainly try to understand the behaviors that they're currently. Um, so no, I haven't, I'm, you know, I, I don't think so. I think the, the things that I've seen, um, honestly, and, and the programs I think I'm most interested in terms of those breeds are programs to understand that those breeds are more at risk and to try to figure out ways to mitigate that risk. Um, and so Chicago's a great example. I was just there and working with them. And they definitely have, um, you know, a huge proportion of the animals that are coming in are either pit bull or phenotypically look like pit bulls. 
Um, and so we talked about, well, what can we do? What can we do to try to convince more people to take pit bulls out? And an, another agency in Chicago, Paws Chicago, offered for any rescue group that will take a pit bull out of the shelter, the animal control shelter, they'll do the spay and neuter for free. So they're try we're trying to come up with incentives. You know, what if we offered a microchip to every rescue group or a you know, microchip and a heartworm test, you know, to make it easier for them? Could the idea being, again, decreased length of stay in the rescue group. So if we can do things that will make it easier to place those animals into homes, maybe they'll be able to move through the rescue groups more quickly, and then the rescue groups will be able to pull more animals out. Make sense? Is that what you're thinking of? Is there something else specific? Huh, that's interesting. So I haven't heard of that. I'm, I'm guessing that that's, you know, there's a bunch of other shelters that are doing that. It's, it's not something I would tend to recommend. Being, again, my gist, I'll be really honest about this if you haven't figured it out, my gist is to get them in and get them out. <laughs> um, because the shelter's no place to, you know, it's no place to grow up, it's no place to hang out, it's a place to come if you really don't have anywhere else to go. And as soon as you do, go somewhere else. Um, that's, the, that's the thing. Okay, so let's talk about cats in San Francisco SPCA. This is one of my uh, funnest cases that, that I, uh, have worked on. Um, so we were asked to come. They were really frustrated. Um, oh, let me just tell you who they are. So they are a shelter. They found homes for 400,000, uh, sorry, 4,000 cats and dogs last year. Their primary intake comes from a pact they have in San Francisco between the San Francisco SPCA and the Animal Control Facility. Um, they do some direct owner surrendered intake, but not a lot. Um, their community per capita intake is very, very low. <laughs> they have worked on this for a really long time. Um, I wish I had the numbers for you. I don't have them in front of me. But if we look at, uh, at cities across the U.S., San Francisco is one of the lowest per capita you know, animal intakes per capita. Um, they do take some transfer intake from other shelters. So they wanted us to come to a consultation. The problems identified were that they had this large daily population of cats, commonly over 400 cats each day. Um, many of them had special needs. Many of them, in fact, most of them had extended stays. The big thing we sort of focused in on was that many healthy kittens, because so what we do when we're looking at risk is one of the things we do first is to look at those low-hanging fruits. We want to make sure that the easy ones are easy. So many healthy kittens were becoming ill with URI after returning from foster care. So they'd go out to foster care. They'd be doing just great. They'd come in, and then they'd get sick. So there were large numbers each day requiring care and treatment. And when I say large numbers, they were doing 1,000 treatments a day, a large number. Um, which was obviously then leading to extended stays. Most of them were getting well and then getting adopted. Um, but many of the kittens were housed in small cages, and the staff really st felt stretched far beyond their capacity. They came up with this slogan, every animal needs a plan, <laughs> until they were talking to me. Be mindful of patterns and processes that would speed flow. Identify bottlenecks. They wanted to eliminate unproductive waiting time, allow more time for those who really need it, increase opportunities for treatment. So they wanted to be able to treat more and provide adequate or excellent housing to each cat. So we started looking at the foster program to figure out, well, why is everybody getting sick? It's a vibrant, really vibrant foster program. Many, many young kittens going out to foster and returning at adoption age. They had surgery clinics for foster animals each Sunday with kittens going up for adoption on Monday morning. So guess what we changed? This is the other reason I had to spend so much time going back to school to become a veterinarian. What did we change? Why? So somebody said we want to change when they go up for adoption. And she said, because people come in for adoption on the weekend. So what do you want to tell them? 
put them on production on Thursday or Friday. That's exactly what we told them. So right, no rocket science, no need to go to veterinary school, really. <laughs> Except you need to understand the disease processes, right? Going back to foster home for surgery after recovery period, but they, didn't, they don't really need to, and I'll show you why. So what we changed is we instituted Foster Fridays instead of Foster Sundays, right? So what was happening was they would do surgery on Sunday, and then they'd put them up for adoption. So we could do this the same way if they wanted to do surgery on Sunday. They could do surgery on Sunday and then go back to foster care and then come in on Thursday, right? That would be okay. Except then what they'd probably be doing is spending a little more time in foster. Maybe not. So that would work. But they switch their surgery clinic days for foster kittens to Friday and sometimes Thursday, increase their spay-neuter capacity to be sure that they could all get done on that day. And the kittens were adopted out incredibly quickly. They, like they were leaving in two or three days because they were all going home over the weekend. And we could see that when we pulled their statistics. So you're knowing it just by intuition. But when we pulled their adoption statistics, we could see um, that all the big numbers for the numbers who were going home were all on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, and so basically what happened is they had fewer kittens in the shelter each day, dramatically fewer, because they went from an average length of stay of about 21 days to a month because they were all getting treatment. So they were on this long winding road getting URI and getting, so first they'd wait a week, then they'd get sick, then they go get treatment, then they get better. And so, um, and then they went to about two or three days for their turnaround. They were able to give everybody better quality housing, very little shelter acquired disease in foster return. So this was really fun and dramatic. Um, they maintain daily population now at about 180 cats instead of over 400. They base that on something called adoption driven capacity, which we'll see if we can roll back around to. And they started when the population was low and then maintained by decreased length of stay. So just what we were talking about when we played the game. Um, the veterinarian works with the intake coordinator so they get a sense of how many new animals they should be taking in based on the number that they've been able to place. They do a daily rounds to do evaluation. Um, intake is really driven by adoptions. Um, the pact creates some level of uncontrolled intake for them because they've got an agreement that they'll take animals, but then they know that, so that puts pressure on them to do more promotions and marketing to get those animals placed. Um, they actually even closed the upper part of their adoption center um, so that they only had half as many animals up for adoption. And because that actually leads us to the next, well, actually, I'll come back to that. So if we think about this in terms of costs and resources, which we were talking about, we can say, well, OK, what if they had a daily population of 422 cats, which they did, um, and you multiply that by 30 days in the month. That tells us they had a monthly care days, a little over 12,000 care days every month, um, versus if they had 150, they would have 4,500 care days a month. And if we say that a care day probably at minimum is about $10 a day just to have an animal in the shelter, that's the lowest estimate I've seen a shelter make of how much it costs to have an animal in the shelter each day. You can see that the care day difference in terms of the cost is over $81,000 a month. And so if you take that out annually, it's almost a million and think about all the things you could do with these two dollars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's not true of San Francisco. So San Francisco has actually been able to take, oh, sorry, so the question was, that in both examples did the shelters decrease the number of voluntary intakes. And it's actually not true in Tampa either. So they made it a little more difficult to do those, but I don't think, I'd have to pull their statistics, I don't think their owner surrenders actually went down in Tampa. 
Um, but in San Francisco, they're actually able to take more animals. And that's one thing I'm getting at, is because their, um, their intake is driven by adoption, they were really pushing their marketing and getting all those animals through more quickly, they could take more animals. So even though, again, they had fewer animals in the shelter every day, they were actually able to help more animals. So that was pretty cool. And that's been true of Dane County as well. So Dane County, because they've been able to maintain their population so much lower, they've actually, I mean, I don't think I ever thought this would happen. You know, they've even transferred in cats this year several times from other shelters in Wisconsin um, at times when they were low. I mean, there's been times where you go in the winter and there's just not that many cats there and they'll take, you know, they took 30 cats from a shelter in Stevens Point. Um, and they've, you know, they've been taking animals from lots of different shelters. So that part's pretty cool. The other thing that I want to address is the question of those, so the, the other part of the question was, so those animals aren't just disappearing, where are they going? Um, there's not any great research on that that I've seen yet, but there's some research. Um, some that I saw um, was from Virginia, and they actually did track what was happening in the whole community and saw that there was no increase at the other shelters. Anecdotally, um, another uh, community that I worked with, when they started doing this, they thought they would also see an increase either in stray relinquishments or in um, owner surrenders you know, at, a, at the animal control facility. Instead, what started happening is that the rescue group started complaining because people were trying to find alternative placements for their animals. Um, the Minneapolis Humane Society, which is Animal Humane Society up in Minneapolis, did a really cool project where they actually tried to follow up on people who called in and people who decided not to bring their animal to the shelter for one reason or another after calling and having an owner surrender appointment. And what they found is a large majority of those people either decided to keep the animal or found an alternate placement for the animal and didn't end up relinquishing it. Um, a few shelters in Dane County is one of them. Um, as an alternative to owner surrender, put up a, a rehoming website so that um, like if you can't keep your dog anymore, instead of bringing it to the shelter, you can put it on the rehoming website and rehome it yourself. So they offer support to rehome the animal instead of relinquishing it to the shelter. So there's lots of different ways around it. I can't say it never happens. And there is one shelter that I work with where when they made, they felt like when they made owner surrendering a little more difficult that people were more inclined to come in and say that the animal was a stray. Um, but again, it's not, it's not as universal as, as people sometimes think. Um, so this is results. This probably looks like not so great for you guys to see. This is the um, length of stay for adult cats. And the drop is this green part. So you can see how different the length of stay was. It really fell quite a bit um, for the adult cats. And this is the part I wanted you to see, is that here's where their adoption started actually increasing. Um, and so that, if, for them, increased adoptions means that they took more in because um, that's how they, they make that, that's how they make that happen. Um, so they ended up with what increased capacity for care, and that's a really common term that we use. And again, it's a very relative term, right? If you have a set amount of capacity to provide care and you have 400 animals to care for, you have less capacity per animal than if you have 200 animals. So your increased capacity, your your capacity for care increases as your length of stay drops. Um, they had increased life-saving capacity because they could bring animals in. Increased ability to treat special conditions like hyperthyroidism or injuries. All their cats get condos or double-sided cages now. Uh, much happier app, uh, staff. And one thing they wanted, they included in the PowerPoint was this group of cats called the 49ers. Um, where they took this 49 cats from another shelter that had a hoarding case and they all had ringworms. Um, and previously they would not have been able to manage that, but because they had a whole empty ward, they were able to say, you know what, give us the cats. They treated them off for ringworm. And now they've actually started a program, and I'm trying to remember what it's called, and I feel bad I don't remember, but it's like an outreach program for ringworm where they'll help other shelters 
Um, so they've been able to sort of expand their capacity. Again, it's all about like nothing wasted. Just we don't have enough time or resources to waste time or resources <laughs> in inefficient ways. We want every single minute of of time and every moment, you know, that we're spending energy investing in something we want to go to a life saving cause. Okay, so that's, we're talking about capacity. I'm going to pop us back into our presentation here and talk about how can we think about capacity and what sort of methods can we use for evaluating it. So this is one method that we use, and this is based on uh, both a Humane Society of the United States and the National Animal Control Association have come up with these numbers where they say, well, it takes about 15 minutes per animal per day to provide basic and what they're talking about is cleaning and feeding, pretty much. Um, I think they say, yeah, six minutes for feeding and nine minutes for cleaning. Obviously, that's going to be different at every shelter. Um, if you have double-sided kennels, it probably takes less time than if you have a single-sided kennel. We've got really lovely research to show that if you give dogs a double-sided kennel, they almost always will poop and pee on the side that doesn't have their bed and their food. So how much easier does that make cleaning? Sometimes you don't even have to clean their living room. You just have to clean the bathroom. Um, so you may even only need to clean half the kennels that day and can save a lot of time. Definitely true with cats. When we give them double-sided cages and we spot clean, we can save tons of money and we probably keep the cats happier and healthier too. Um, so you, know, you can use these numbers. You can time in a shelter doing particular tasks, and then you can multiply that by the number of animals that you have in care to try to figure out, well, what is the required capacity? So here's just an example where we've got 40 animals times 15 minutes equals 600 minutes or 10 hours of staff time. But again, we don't want to spend 10 hours cleaning and feeding because then animals will be sitting all day in dirty kennels and not have anything to eat. So we can say that's three staff members for three and a half hours to get the job done by 12.30. Does that make sense? So you can time your own staff. You can check out medical staffing Excel tool that we made that's on our website. Um, and uh, there's lots of different ways of sort of making those assessments, but it's important to kind of understand how those assessments work. Did I show you guys this video? I feel like I did it. Did I show you this in the intro? OK. So I'm going to show this, I hope. Oops. So for everybody who's online, sorry, did I just blow out your ears, Nadine? <laughs> it's not playing over my computer, so I couldn't tell. Sorry. So tell me, do you see anything wrong? This is breakfast at a shelter. What do you see going on? Is that normal activity? What's not normal? I heard somebody say it's not normal. You can say it out. There's no wrong answer. They didn't get fed yet. Right before breakfast, sorry. They're just about to get fed. Great. This one especially, right, who's just got his nose sticking in the back of the cage. And this one who's not moving really at all. So let me play it one more time. So everybody else is really enthused, right? Well, this one's actually up a little bit at the front, but this guy's not moving at all. And there's more in this kennel. We're going to take a closer look at this kennel. And this is, I, this is my sad kitten video, just so you're prepared. So here he comes. He's going to feed these animals. He has, I think, 450 cats to feed this morning, this one guy. Um, so rather than having the six minutes that's recommended right, for feeding, he has about, what is that, five or 10 seconds, maybe, to come in. This whole video is only two minutes long. So even if all we had was two minutes to watch in this cage, let's see 
what we would pick up on and what we would what we would understand about these individual animals and the population differently if we stay and we watch. So what's going on? He's having, is that what's going on? He's having a hard time finding a place to stand. What's he doing with his mouth? Why is he doing that with his mouth, Carl? That's usually a sign that a kitten's feeling kind of sick. It's like a sign of nausea, usually. Is he eating? No, he's kind of grossed out by the food. So he's looking at the food and thinking, I might want to eat it, and then he's like, no, nah, I don't want to eat that. If this guy, if that guy comes back to monitor eating for this kennel after he's finished feeding everybody else, is he going to know that this kitten didn't eat? And so what's going to be the consequence of that for this kitten? So he, he's sick now because he, that's probably why he's not eating. Sorry, somebody said something back there? He might die, right, because he's not eating. He's probably sick, which is the reason that he's not eating. But nobody's recognizing that he's really sick and he needs care. Right? So sorry, it's my second video. I warned you. So <laughs> the point is that this is the consequence, right, of having inadequate capacity for care. Because this kitten might die, and I've experienced this where a shelter calls me and tells me that what they've seen is sudden death. This isn't sudden death, right? And as soon as the shelter then puts a monitoring program in place, miraculously the sudden death stops because they're picking things up earlier at a time when intervention would still be effective and possible. So um, that's the consequence for him as an individual, right? What's happening for the population as a whole? Because we're not recognizing. So all those kittens are exposed to whatever he has, and they probably were already because they're all together. But the consequence of leaving him there longer means that they get a higher infectious dose, right? Because infectious dose has to do with the amount of shedding and the amount of time that that dose is put out, right? What about all the other animals in the shelter? Same deal, right? Infectious dose is going to be higher because we don't recognize it because he stays there longer because he's getting sicker. And because since we don't recognize, did you notice when he first went into the cage and the cats came to the front that he's sort of pushing them back in, right? So over time, everything else in the shelter is getting more exposed because he hasn't identified that those animals are sick. So by not identifying that, he's not treating them specially. Whereas if he had identified them as being sick, then maybe he'd change his gloves. Maybe he'd handle them last. Maybe they'd be in a special place so that they weren't going to expose all the other animals in the shelter. So sorry, because it is a really sad video. But I think it makes the point really well why it's so important to be shelter A <laughs> instead of shelter B that really the difference between shelter A and shelter B is a very, very important life-saving difference. Um, and so that's why it's so important. Um, again, this is actually a graph of the staffing from that very shelter. Um, and the green bars represent their actual inventory. So the actual census in the shelter was these green bars. So at some points during the year, they had 650 animals. At some points, they had a little less, right around 400 animals, but never less than that. The top black line represents the recommendations for staffing that we would have made based on that. Um, I think it was based on, this one was actually based on 10 minutes per animal per day. And, that, and that's red over here on this other side of the graph. So you can see that when they had 400 animals in care, the recommended staffing to provide the care they needed 
would have been not quite 70 hours of staff time. What you see on the bottom, these little sort of pinkish bars, is the, the census that we recommended based on what we would call adoption-driven capacity, the productive number of animals to have in the shelter. So how many animals they would have in the shelter if they were shelter A, right? Not by killing more animals, not even by adopting more animals, but, but just by being more efficient in their processes. And ironically, this red line represents what the recommended staffing would be for that number of animals. And again, ironically, that's actually what they had. So they had about 20 hours of staff time trying to take care of, trying to meet a need for about 100 hours. And so what happens? Animals just get less care. And that's where you end up killing more animals than what you really um, wish and, and what really uh, needs to have happened. Um, so this, again, just kind of shows the cost breakdown of that and how that, um, how that plays out. And you can see it's hugely different, right? And if, if your real goal ultimately is strategically finding ways of saving lives, again, you don't want to waste any money and you don't want to waste any resources. What do you guys think? Questions on this? Have you ever been in a shelter that defines a pathway at the point of intake? Have you ever been in shelters that don't? Do you feel like you can sort of feel the difference when you're there? Wisconsin Humane is another one if you if you ever get a chance. I, I know somebody worked for Wisconsin Humane, right? Yeah. Um, Wisconsin Humane is a is an interesting example to me of pathway planning for um, for their transport. That you know they have it really defined. Kind of the transport comes in. Here's what happens on day one, here's what happens on day two, and hopefully, you know, here's what happens on day three, and then the animals should hopefully leave quite quickly. And then um, after that happens, they know another transfer is coming in. So they have this very, very sort of carefully orchestrated pathway. Um, and it's real interesting to see, especially when they're, you know, when they're really working well. Um, how the animals move through, and marketing is a huge piece of that, so that the animals that come in um, leave quickly, and animals that are not leaving as quickly as they might think, they get in and start to market those animals. And one of my favorite comments that I ever heard Rich Avancino say, he was the director of the San Francisco SPCA, and when he was there, if the animal was in the shelter longer than two weeks, he would call a staff emergency and they would all sit down and talk about, you know, how, what do we need to do to get the animal out of the shelter. Um, and so in my fantasy world, <laughs> there's someone in every shelter who's kind of chasing everybody else around, um, making them understand the importance of even one wasted day for one animal. Um, and again, goes back to what I had talked about very early on, which is that one wasted day for one animal has an impact for that individual animal and also for the population as a whole. And we need to be able to have that back and forth vision to understand how those things fit together. That's all I have for tonight. If, I mean, if you guys have questions, I'm totally happy to talk about them. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So the question is, when people do owner-surrendered animals, are they shown all the other animals in the shelter um, because they might want to adopt a different animal? Um, I've seen shelters where, um, so here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk out of turn a little bit and say, I see shelters do lots of different things. I would say, in general, 
Um, I won't say in general. Some shelters, um, in some shelters, people are not very, um, don't feel real positively about people that are waiting for treatment on them. Um, and I think there's been a sort of move and a push to um, have shelters think a little differently about the people who are surrendering animals. Um, and to understand that maybe, really, it's not a good match. <laughs> it may be, really, the person did do everything they could have done um, to, you know, to make it work between them. And maybe the best thing is to try to rehome that animal. I think the part of it that's true is that if you're going to bring an animal to an animal shelter, you should have tried everything else. So did you try to rehome the animal yourself? Did you try to find a friend that would take it? All of those things that, the sh that in general, bringing an animal to the shelter, I hope for most people would be a last resort. Um, but so all of that being said, I've never heard of a shelter that offers someone who's relinquishing an animal um, to, you know, hey, do you want to see our other animals and take one home? Um, I'm not saying it would be a wrong thing to do, I, but I haven't seen a shelter that does do that. What I have seen is shelters that when a person adopts an animal and it isn't working out and they want to bring the animal back, um, will say, you know, do you want to pick a different animal? Um, and that, I think, is pretty common. Uh, the, the question that I thought you were asking um, is when people own or surrender their animals, do shelters show them all the other animals in the shelter and tell them honestly about what the risks are for that animal when it gets relinquished. Um, and I think there's a wide range of answers to that question depending on the organization. That some shelters um, are very open and honest and will say, you know, in this community we have a 20% live release rate for cats and we hope you know that. Um, and others will say, you know, we have a 90% live release rate for cats and isn't that great and so it's okay that you're giving us your cat. Um, but, you know, things will vary. Um, and people's response to that varies, too. A lot of it has to do with the style, I think, in which that's communicated. Some people will, you know, you'll tell them that they'll say, you know, wow, your cat that's peeing outside the box um, doesn't have a great chance of getting adopted with us. And, you know, if, if still you want to relinquish it, we'll take it from you, but we want you to know that. And then they'll say, oh, I'm going to go try to figure something else out. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Before adoption. It wasn't a strike against you. So uh, she's saying, just to repeat what she's saying, so they went and toured in South Chicago, and they actually do kind of a two-week trial period when you've adopted an animal. And if, you, if it's not working out, you bring the animal back. Animal Rescue League also does a foster to adopt for some of their behavior program dogs. So um, if you want to try it and you're just not totally sure but that you want to commit, but you want to give it a try, you can take the animal home. And if it's not working out, that's fine. And if it is, you know, then you move through on to adoption. Um, and that's definitely something I've seen shelters do, especially with more special needs kind of animals. Some shelters even actually have policies not to adopt if you've ever owned or surrendered an animal to them. But hopefully fewer and fewer. Yeah. Well, let's talk about it. So the question is, how would you make a pathway for a puppy? I have a puppy right now. So my little pit bull puppy, um, she came from Chicago Animal Care and Control and came up to the Dane County Humane Society. So let's talk about what would you like her pathway to be? Yeah. So they don't. And Dane County, it is really hard to find fosters for dogs. Um, and uh, really hard to find fosters for puppies, especially. Um, 
and I will speak to it. I mean, I've got a foster puppy. I've got lots of work to do, and she's not half broken yet. I mean, she's almost half broken now, but she wasn't when I got her. It's a lot of work. Um, and she's not even so hard. So one thing that's really cool is the dog den in Madison, when I have little foster pit bull puppies, will let me bring them to the dog den during the day. And so it makes it doable for me, you know, because she can go to school all day <laughs> while I'm working. And then I can pick her up in the afternoon, and then we can do all sorts of fun things. And she's kind of tired. Um, and so that's a program that's really important in her pathway, right? So she came in, so she's transfer to foster, and actually she got, she's getting adopted um, by somebody who works there. Um, and so she's going to go adoption from foster care. What if there wasn't foster care available for her? So that's the idea. What if there wasn't? Then what would we make her pathway? And if you put them in a shelter and you don't pay attention to them for a long time. Um, so what she's saying is uh, hopefully there's some kind of program involved where if the puppy's going to come in, it's going to get massive amounts of socialization because uh, they don't get better behaved if you just leave them in a kennel in a shelter. What, um, what do we have to balance that with? Mm, and what else? Infectious. Because what do we know about puppies and vaccination? Have you guys had that yet? So there's somebody saying maternal antibodies. Why are maternal antibodies important in a puppy? When we vaccinate them, are we sure that we immunize them? Never sure. M lots of times we do, so that's the good news. <laughs> but sometimes the vaccines can interfere. And so we sort of have to treat puppies as though potentially maybe they didn't get vaccinated. So while we do want to give a massive amount of socialization, because there's no point in having a perfectly protected puppy that's got absolutely no social experience, um, we also need to make sure we protect them from infectious disease. So that's a place where a program like Open Selection or other programs that will get those puppies out of the shelter really, really quickly um, become very, very important. One of my least favorite things in the world to see and one of the reasons I talk a lot about vaccination for puppies is many shelters have the false understanding that if you get two vaccines into a puppy, somehow that puppy is more likely to be immunized. And that's not actually true if you're using a modified live vaccine. You just don't know where those maternal antibodies are. And because the place of highest risk is in the shelter, if you hold on to the puppy for two weeks waiting to give them that second vaccine, you've actually put them more at risk, not put them less at risk with that policy. So you need to really be able to sort of reason through these things and be sure that what you're doing is actually decreasing risk and not increasing it. So yes, socialization. Um, no, for me, on grass. So I want them to develop their surface preference in the home that they go to that definitely you know, is going to be safer than grass in a shelter. Um, lots of shelters have grass, and they just have to deal with it. But putting puppies on grass can be a, a tricky thing, because if Parvo gets into the dirt, it will stay there for long periods of time. Um, so balance, socialization, interaction, and get out of here as quick as you can and go get in your home. And this is a place where it is important. And this is a place where, like, for a bully breed or a breed like a pit bull, where I would say, gosh, that animal is at risk of staying here longer because we know it's harder for us to find homes. That's a place where I would say, you know, there's where we're going to say, yes, I'm going to balance the risk and the benefits of socializing this dog because I know that if this dog is really social, it's going to have a much better chance. And I know that if this dog has one or two knocks against it, it's going to be much, much more difficult, even potentially life-threatening. So sure, parvo is life-threatening, but so is lack of socialization. And so if the longer we think they're going to stay, and we're making that assessment as they come in, 
the more we need to get in there. But there's all sorts of things you can do. You can do in-panel socialization. You can have you know, a clean room where socialization happens. One of the other things you can do is look at antibody titers. If, the, if, the, you know, if you look at a puppy and it's healthy, it has no clinical signs of disease, and it has a positive titer for parvo, it's not going to get parvo. Um, it may be that those are maternal antibodies, and over time those will decline, but that's just another one of those arguments for why they should get out of there as quickly as possible. And that's where, again, you know, marketing comes in and is a key component to, um, to life saving. So from an infectious disease standpoint, do you need to worry about taking the puppy to daycare? Um, you do, but you also need to worry about not taking it to daycare. So the puppy that I have, I did an antibody titer on, and she has a lovely parvo titer and a lovely distemper titer, and so I don't need to worry about it. Um, she's not going to get parvo or distemper, and hopefully because she has no clinical signs and she has an antibody titer, she's not going to give it to anybody else, which was even more of my concern. <laughs> Um, so you have to balance those things, but yeah, it's definitely a concern, but again, it's a balance. If you, depending on the daycare setting, depending on the play group, wherever you go, you know, dogs in the community are less likely to be giving things to shelter dogs than shelter dogs are the other way, but if the doggy daycare center also, you know, requires vaccination and all of those things, the riskiest places are probably puppy socialization classes because all the puppies may potentially not be immunized by their vaccines and we don't know where everybody is and it's a high risk thing. But on the other hand, they're also like one of the most beneficial things for puppies for socialization. And I have seen um, 